Our title is The Sinner Cannot Hold, which some of you may remember from your intro to literature class. It comes from a poem by Yeats called The Second Coming, which he wrote at the advent of the First World War to describe the way in which the world was on the precipice of absolute disaster and that the second coming and the final judgment day was at hand. My own scholarship is concerned with the American preoccupation with apocalypticism and the sense that judgment is always just around the corner. And I'm much more committed to a Darwinian view of the future, which is open-ended and unwritten. Uh, that said, we do live at a time of unprecedented crisis in human history. The economy, as you all know, has dropped in ways that are catastrophic, and we've only just begun to experience the consequences of these changes. The environment, which I was just using the restroom and enjoying the way in which gray water is used here, and there's an effort to make this a green building, but you know as well as I do that efforts like that are few and far between and much too late in coming. The government and its effort to try and sustain a policy of war without end and a commitment to preemptive retaliation has transformed the very notion of what it means to be a nation and what it means to interact with other nations. But we're here today to talk about the crisis in education as a time in which the very notion and nature of how we educate is being changed. I came from an emergency budgetary meeting yesterday with the Dean's Council at Rutgers University. And one way to underscore for you the magnitude of the paradigm shift that we're in, that as the major motor industries go out of business in this country, the financial industry collapses. Uh, I'm dealing with people who are upset that their research budgets are being cut and they're being deprived of the, the ability to Xerox books and hand them out in class. That commitment to paper and the commitment to education as we've always known it uh, is a sign of people who live in the Ptolemaic universe. The paradigm shift that we're experiencing is one that is more significant than the invention of the printing press. And I would say to you, it's more significant than the transformation to the Copernican universe. As you look at how education continues to unfold, I think you have to admit that education itself has remained virtually like what it was in the 19th century. And so what we need to do is begin to imagine how to think and teach differently. A true paradigm shift is not squeezing the same old thought into a new tube of toothpaste, but it is trying to think and communicate in fundamentally different ways. So the crises that Richard was referring to, obviously, are unprecedented precisely because they're global in nature. And I think we're all experiencing that. Everybody in this room understands that. But it's also, I think, important to question whether it's practical to look at these things simply as crisis that is going to stop everybody in their tracks and wait for someone to come up with the answer or to look at the opportunities that are offered by these unprecedented events. And for us in education, that's what we're asking ourselves. How do we move forward within this kind of open access to information that we all now enjoy? How do we integrate that uh, into teaching and learning in ways that are, again, not uh, retrofitting what we've already done, but acknowledge the, 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 the true shift in paradigm? So for us, it's important to recognize that this is the machine of our age. But this isn't going to be a presentation about how technology is going to solve all the problems that were just described. Technology in itself, if we can just make bigger, faster, more powerful computers, is not going to solve these problems. And in education, we've all experienced a number of runs through promises from technology that didn't pan out. If we just put a laptop in every student's hands, that in itself will solve the problems in education, right? They'll learn. Um, and we also uh, are not dedicated to following the next technology shiny nickel, right? If we can just get our students to Twitter about World of Warcraft in Second Life, we're all set, right? They'll, 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 uh, they'll get the multitasking skills that they need, and that'll be it. So it's important, I think, that uh, 
that we acknowledge these things, that we see what technology can and can't do. But we don't come at this from the other side and say, it's all a distraction. Everybody, close your laptops, turn off your cell phones, turn off your iPods, and we'll all lock you in a room with books. And that's the answer, because that's not acknowledging the world that we live in either. So for us as educators and as people in the humanities who work in ideas and how to compose with and express ideas, for us it's important to start out by recognizing how the central act of writing has changed. So we all take this for granted now, but it's important for us at least to acknowledge that this has transformed how all of us actually work. The ability to now move around text is to, in fact, move around ideas. So the way that we compose has changed, but the access now that we have to information has changed. I tell people that when I was in graduate school in the 90s, I lived in the library, 8, 10, 12 hours a day, every day. I haven't been back to a library since. And it's not because I don't read. I read now more than I ever did. But I have access to this information anywhere. The example that you see before you is from an essay that Richard wrote recently in response to the massacre at Virginia Tech. And it draws heavily on government documents, documents from around the web. And he can access this information from anywhere. I did some of this work in Europe. This is access to information that's truly unprecedented. But it's not simply the access to information, the, the ability to compose, but also the ability to get our work out there. As we all know, we, have, we can pose differently, we can access information differently, and we can publish that information differently. But it's not only the ability to get our work into print, but the fact that our work lives side by side with the work online. So it, it's the speed with which we can get our work out there. But also, it's the ability now to talk about this in a circle. Our ideas get out there, and they're able to be accessed by others. So it's a beginning of a closing to this circle. It's wonderful to be able to publish something and have it remain available. If those of you who are members of the AUP may well have received the issue of Academe, and then over time it made its way into the trash can, and you might now be interested in this, and you could go get it. But it's important for everybody to understand that that's just a better way of distributing information. That's not actually a fundamental change. The fundamental change is that this technology enables a kind of collaborative work that's never before been possible. That closes a much more important loop. In the history of writing instruction, the teaching of writing has always been bedeviled by the fact that the audience is always a fiction. Your teacher says to you, think of your audience. And the student says, I am. It's you, <laughs> right? But now, with this mode of publishing, you can get out and you can get feedback on the material you produce. But what we're interested in is that also this multimedia collaborative technology transforms the fundamentally passive experience that we've all had in front of screens. You watch something and you may sit in your barca lounge or grumbling at the news, but that doesn't change anything. Now it's possible to pull this material down and compose with moving images, archival photos, produce your own counter response, publish it for free and globally distribute it instantaneously. That is unprecedented. Gutenberg made it possible to churn out books which were then still located in space and time. It got us out of oral culture, but it did not get us into this mode, which allows us to network in this fundamentally new way and expand the mental powers of humans working together. So for us, it's a matter of getting our students, this is what we're interested in with our project, which we refer to as a new humanities, which is to have students engage with the problems of our time, the issues, the central issues of our time. The problems of our time, global warming, global climate change, they don't have solutions. The economic crisis doesn't have a solution. These problems have ways of being understood and worked through. So for us, it's essential to introduce our students to the complexity and depth of these issues, not to use the technology to allow a certain superficial flyover, which we often see, but to use the technology, again, for the best of what it can do, which is to provide access to the complexity 
of these issues, but then to allow them to drill down deeply. And it's not only access, it's access to information in a way that allows our students to better understand not only the complexity, but the depth. It's complex issues in their depth. And it's access to the mode of composition that is clearly the most powerful mode of expression in the 21st century. I do come from a literature department, but it would be foolhardy to say that if you want to know which way the wind blows, why don't you go read the bestseller list? Books are not the main vehicle for people communicating the most important issues at this time. Now, that does represent a loss. Writing is a technology for thinking, and books allow for a kind of extended thought that is clearly endangered by the power of this technology to produce your favorite video of your cat sleeping next to the hamster and posting it to YouTube and getting a million hits. Okay, <laughs> So it does lend itself to a grotesque triviality and the only protected form of expression in the realm of international copyright, which is parody. And that's what we get on YouTube. And that's where we're getting our news now. The best news we can get is on Comedy Central because that allows people to use this intellectually protected work and use it parodically. But the university isn't a space for producing parodies of reality. Our responsibility is to create an environment that encourages deliberation, speculation, meditation. Those are the activities of thinking through the complexity of ideas. We have an argument culture, and an argument culture is actually antithetical to the generation of new thought. So again, it's giving our students, or allowing them to understand how the access to information that they have, the fact that this information is now in multimedia or in dimension, and that's not just sound files and multimedia files, it's motion graphics, it's ways of visualizing information that we didn't have before. We didn't have last year, two years ago. Right? You go to the front page of the New York Times, you want to find out what's going on with the economic crisis. They have a map of the country where you can go in county by county and find out what the unemployment rate is county by county, right? So it's shades of, of mustard, right? So if you go to Michigan, it's brown, right? So this, this allows people to understand in ways that we didn't have before visualizations of information that are accessible to everybody. So we feel that it's our responsibility as educators to not only introduce our students to this information, but also to help them think through it, to get behind the information that they have access to so that they can see how it's put together and then again, what to do with it. How do I take this information? How do I take this access that I now have and work with it myself? When we all went to school, everybody in this room, we walked into our class with a text. And the professor was the expert, so-called, on that text. And we responded to that text with text. Our students walk into class now with the same access that you guys have with your laptops. You open up your laptop, you have access to essentially all texts, right? That's not a subtle incremental change. That is a fundamental shift. And not only do they have access to all text, they have access to information in this kind of dimension. So it's, we feel, as compositionists, that it's our responsibility to help our students think through this. And it's something that we, to this point, have not done particularly well. So what we've done at Rutgers is we thought, well, OK, where do we start? Right? How do we begin ourselves to make sense out of this? So we did what you and the sciences are very good at. We designed a kind of controlled experiment. So we launched Writer's House, which is a space for creative expression, as we call it. But we're interested, primarily Richard and I, in we have creative writing courses, we have creative fiction courses, and also multimedia fiction courses. But we're interested in creative nonfiction. How can we get students, as we've said, in the new humanities to understand the human dimension of these problems that we see around us, or the issues? We don't want to couch everything in terms of problems. So we've, we isolated four central things that we feel that we need to work through. Access to ubiquitous computing, which if you look around this campus is not a big problem. Spaces that allow for a different kind of access to information around the world, which again, if you look around this campus, doesn't seem to be a problem. It's different for us. 
But those two things I can imagine. I look at the access to computing and I look at spaces. I can easily envision those spaces. And I can project ahead five years. And I can see that students are not going to be opening up their laptops and composing in Microsoft Word. They're going to be opening up their laptops and composing in whatever Final Cut Pro is called at that time. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a, a word processing. We're not going to be teaching keyboarding. We're going to be teaching the, the, the how to compose with ideas, and those ideas are going to be in dimension, right? So the, the, the difficult thing for us is to say, okay, how do, we prepare, uh, our, how do we prepare teachers to teach in this space? And then how do we redefine our pedagogies to allow for this type of teaching, right? So those we see as the four fundamental problems, the, the last two being the ones that for us are the most vexing and, and bedeviling. And those are the problems where the paradigm shift is experienced on the ground. Ubiquitous computing is money well spent. And that's a rarity in our country, obviously, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a success here at MIT, right? So it, that can be done. But to approach the problem of uh, the new teaching that is necessary in this environment and the new ways of assessing the results of that as simply something that we already know how to do and we just have to upgrade it, we need teaching version 2.0, is to misunderstand how fundamental the change is. When we shifted from Ptolemy to Copernicus, we spent about 900 years denying all of the data and adding a couple of more circles to the Ptolemaic model until we finally said, you know, it's totally broken. I think it's time that we acknowledged that the way that we teach is totally broken. I encourage you to spend time going to your local high schools. We had dinner with a, a co close colleague who teaches in a community college here in Boston. I'm still recovering. <laughs> <laughs> and, and those stories were horrifying and shocking about what our nation has done to public education. And if we just say, well, it will be fixed by an input of money, stimulus money, that's to deny that what we need to figure out how to do is teach in a fundamentally different way. And that begins by saying, when we say the center cannot hold, education has always been designed first and foremost for the convenience of the teachers. So when we talk about student-centered education, we mean putting students face-to-face -face with the fundamental experience of learning, which means being frustrated, being challenged, confronting your own ignorance, and pushing through that. That's awkward, uncomfortable, and here in a science community, you guys know that learning is always about being frustrated and struggling with long periods of doing the same thing over only to have to pour the results down the sink. That's what learning is. Learning how to write and learning how to think is a lifelong process. And yet at the university, it's a one semester course that everybody hates. <laughs> So what we did at, at Rutgers, again, is we developed a Writer's House as a space to sort of work through some of these issues. And from there, it encouraged us to think past where we are to where we need to go. So for us, this is actually the building that Richard and I teach in. And the front part is about 100 years, well, it's over 100 years old. No, it's coming up on its 100th year. Week. Yeah. And the back part was added on a little bit later. So we're teaching our students in a space that was literally designed in a different century. So what we've been thinking through is, okay, how do we scale up the space that we have and produce learning spaces that, that are going to be, we feel, necessary for teaching in the 21st century? So we've started other initiatives on the ground, and one of the ones that we're most excited about is what we call the Plangier Culture Lab. Plangier was the benefactor for the initial project that Richard worked on, and we've designed the Plangier Culture Lab, and we call it a lab, not in the sense of a computer lab, right? What's a computer lab? It's a room with a lot of computers in it. That's not a lab. You guys work in labs. So we consciously designed this space as a lab, a culture lab. It's a space where they can work through 
this type of composition. So it's a true lab. It's a learning space, not a space with a lot of computers in it. So we're looking ahead through some of the spaces that we've already designed to spaces we see as being fundamental to education, to teaching and learning in the model that we're describing, where we're looking at education not as tweaking what we have, but as a fundamental shift. It's a shift that allows two English teachers to do this. These are a couple of guys who are used to working in words who can now walk people through virtual spaces. And that's the shift that we're interested in having our students experience in the uh, culture lab. We say we have an atelier pedagogy and we're fundamentally committed to learning as being an experience. It's an embodied experience and that we want them to move from learning this technology to being able to think with it. So we're not teaching Final Cut Pro. Our job is to teach students how to think with this technology. The same way we try to teach them how to think with writing. Writing is a technology that was created for extending our mental powers. The vast majority of the use of this technology right now is for goofing around. Admit it. We have not made the shift from utter passivity in the face of a bottomless sea of visual data to moving towards creating a culture that can think with this technology. That's the urgency of our moment. Yes, any of us can press podcast and post up whatever we're saying up here. That isn't thinking. The thinking is what we have to teach as educators. And the challenge is to move this technology from being entertainment to being a source for imagining a better future for us all.